when thinking about the brain, we know that it is a very complicated structure. But it wasn't always that complicated. So if we look at the top of the image here, we see that early in the process of brain development. So this is week five after fertilization. And at this point, the brain and spinal cord has been sort of a tube. And then around week five, the tube starts to fold up and twist up a little bit. And by week 13, we're seeing some primitive brain structures present. And then at birth, we see a complete brain structure present. So the shape of the brain and the organization of messaging within the brain actually originates from that original tube that folds back and forth on itself to eventually result in an adult brain structure. Some things we need to know and understand about the brain and spinal cord too for that matter here in the central nervous system is the idea of gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is found on the outside surface of the brain and on the inside core of the spinal cord. White matter is found on the inside of the brain and the outside of the spinal cord. Gray matter is basically nerve cell bodies. White matter is mostly axons. So I guess you could say gray matter is processing material. White matter is simply sending the message on out somewhere else matter. And so we find those positions changing. So the processing was occurring on the outside surface of the brain. And the communicating was happening on the inside of the brain. As the brain transitions to the spinal cord, those roles reverse and the processing material moves to the inside of the spinal cord and the communicating material moves to the outside. That's somewhat logical because in the brain everything is coalescing or concentrating towards the middle so it makes sense to think on the outside and process or send that information in towards the middle to send it out because the spinal cord is located in the middle. And in the spinal cord, the processing occurs in the middle and then it's sent on out to the rest of the body through the white matter on the outside as the interface. At least in my mind, that makes a little bit of logical sense when I think about it that way. Just remember, gray matter is cell bodies, meaning processing. White matter is the axons, meaning communication. If we look here on the inside of the brain, we can see that, that the gray matter again on the outside, white matter on the inside. And there are some chunks of gray matter scattered through the middle of the brain as well. But by and large, most of it is on the outside surface and what we call the cerebral cortex. The brain is very jelly-like, as perhaps you would recall from the uh, Dr. Gunther video in chapter uh, 9, that probably was, with dropping the brain on the floor, and it basically would just splatter everywhere. So the brain doesn't have a lot of rigid structure to maintain its shape. Its shape is really determined by the inner dimensions and shapes of the skull, and then the, the brain itself just floats inside. So what you have is the brain is floating in what we call cerebrospinal fluid. And it has to float because, again, it doesn't have rigid structures to maintain its shape. Otherwise, it would just become a shapeless blob. So floating on the brain in fluid on the outside of the brain is fine, but the brain mass is such that it would somewhat collapse on itself. So what we find are the ventricles within the brain that are fluid filled compartments that sort of help to float the brain from the inside as well. So the brain is floating in cerebrospinal fluid outside and it's also filled with this uh, ventricle and duct system with fluid on the inside helping to inflate and cushion the brain from both the outside and from the inside. If we look at a brain here from the top, what we find are we find some very critical concepts of the brain's organization. And one is that the brain is really consisting of two parts, the left and right hemispheres. And 
the right hemisphere in this case has had the blood vessels removed so you can see a little bit more brain matter and, and less in the way of blood vessels. And you start to see some names, and we see frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and that should sound very familiar because the area of brain is named based on the skull bone that is found directly over it. So where we would have the occipital bone in the back, we have the occipital lobe. Where we would have the parietal bone, we have the parietal lobe. And what we'll find is that all of those bones of the skull have associated lobes of the brain associated with it. Hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to keep track of the different areas of the brain because you've already learned the bone for that area, you've learned the muscle for that area, and now you've learned the lobe of the brain for that area. And they're all named with the same convention. We also notice here the presence of the longitudinal fissure running right down the middle, splitting the brain into the two hemispheres. Now deep in the middle it is connected and we'll see the wiring of the brain here in a few minutes. But it looks like, for the most part, the brain is two relatively separate halves with, again, that connector in the middle. So what this means is that the right side of the brain, so the right uh, cerebral hemisphere, actually controls the left side of the body. And the left cerebral hemisphere controls the right side of the body. And down there where the brain plugs into the spinal cord, which you'll read about in your reading assignment, is where that crossing over occurs, where the left brain goes to the right body and the right brain goes to the left body. And this is very useful to know from a diagnostic perspective. If someone experiences a stroke and it happens to occur in the right cerebral hemisphere, we would expect the left side of the body to experience paralysis. So assuming a problem with the left side of the body was a problem with the left side of the brain would mean you'd be looking in perfectly healthy tissue for a problem that simply wasn't there. So understanding left brain controls right body, right brain controls left body, is sort of a core understanding of brain function here. So let's say in a particular part of the brain, a particular functionality is carried out. And we'll look at areas of the brain and their associated functions here in a little bit. But so let's say that part of the brain on the right side is responsible for, let's say, um, speech. On the left side of the brain, in the same general location, is going to be a section of the left side that's also associated with speech. So while each side of the brain does everything in a way by itself, the other side of the brain is doing the same things in the same places, and together the two halves are producing the overall function and outcome. What this does mean, though, is that in some cases people with certain brain tumor problems and other things early in life actually end up having half of their brain removed, and they can still have relatively normal function later in life because the half that's there was still involved to some degree in everything, and it just goes ahead and takes over as the sole functioning component of that outcome rather than just being half of the equation. If we look at the brain from the side here we can see those different lobes that we were talking about earlier and they do correspond with the location of the bones. Looking at the brain, it's really a collection of ridges and grooves and all these really convoluted, ugly-looking structures. So here we have some of those named for us. A sulcus is a shallow depression in brain tissue. A fissure is a deep, basically a deep sulcus or a deep depression in brain tissue. And so any time we're talking about a fissure, just understand it's a deep groove. And if we're talking about a sulcus, it's a shallow groove. But the brain is very convoluted in that way. And so it turns out that the gray matter consists of a significant percentage of the brain. About 40% of total brain mass is gray matter. But if we look at the gray matter that's present, and if we go back to this image, we can see the gray matter is primarily on the outside surface, but comprising nearly half of total brain mass because of all these fissures and sulci, and all these ridges and grooves, diving sometimes very deeply down into the core of the brain 
so that the outer surface, because it is so convoluted, does add up to be that about 40%, even though it was only about an eighth of an inch thick at any particular location. So here's the question of what part of the brain does what? And so this particular image of a brain, the front of the brain, the uh, frontal lobe is to the right side. The occipital lobe is going to be on the left side of this image. So if a person is seeing something, we can look at the brain in an MRI and see what part of the brain lights up. That then tells us that part of the brain is functional for that thing, and the parts of the brain that are not lighting up are not overly involved in that process. So seeing clearly involves a, the more anterior portion of the frontal lobe there. And that's no great surprise because that's right behind the eyes. And so the optic nerve would be able to plug in there very nicely. If we look at hearing, hearing happens more towards the temporal lobe area. And again, that would make sense because that's where the ears are located. Speaking happens just a little bit towards the back of the temporal lobe there. And that doesn't necessarily have any obvious explanation for why that's where it is, like we saw with the eyes and ears, but it just is the case. And then we look at thinking. And an interesting thing happens with thinking, and that is most of the entire brain lights up. So really thinking about something is a whole brain process. You can see things and not really have a whole lot of response to that. You can hear things and not have a lot of response. You can even talk and not have a lot of brain engagement. But thinking takes everything and wraps it together. And the more deeply and critically you're thinking, the more the entire brain gets to functioning. And it's sort of interesting that the brain is like doing anything else. The more you use it, the better it gets at doing that particular thing. So the more you think, the better your brain gets at thinking. And the more of the brain will actually get involved in thinking. So that really means if you want to be a better thinker, think more. Use it, and it improves. When we look at brain functionality, we find some interesting things. We can say that a particular area is associated with touch. A particular area is involved in taste. A particular area is involved in smell, and those are all obvious things we can say just by looking at an MRI. But some interesting functionality happens within that. And let's just take um, the somatic sensation area. So over here uh, in the blues towards the top here at the parietal lobe area is where we're going to find touch. And with each of these primary areas, we're going to find a primary somatosensory area, or a, rather a primary sensory area, a association area along with it. So the primary somatosensory area, or the primary somatosensory cortex, would be involved in saying, you're touching something. The somatosensory association area would then say, here's what you're touching. Here's the components of what you're touching. So again, the primary area would say you're touching. The association area might say what you're touching is hard. It's smooth. It's cool to the touch. It's uh, rough or it's smooth and then would help you determine what am I touching based on association of different characteristics of that thing. Uh, my favorite area probably of, of my brain in these functionalities is the gustatory area or the taste area. So there would be a gustatory cortex and then there would be a gustatory association area with that. And that would then tell me, first of all, I'm tasting something and then what is it that I'm tasting? And, and I personally really like the taste of a lot of foods which explains probably why I don't readily lose weight is because I like to eat too much. If we're talking about a visual area, we have a primary visual cortex there in the back of the occipital lobe and then a visual association area. So the primary area would tell you you're seeing something. The visual association area would tell you what you see. So vision is basically a collection of colored dots that comes in. So the primary visual area would receive those colored dots and say, that's visual.
the visual association area would assess or associate those patterns of colored dots into something that has meaning. So that's a person, or that's a tree, or that's a car, or that's a dog. And it can go farther than that, and it can say that's a particular person. And so you don't know what I look like because you've never actually perhaps been around me in person. But you would see me and your primary visual area and your visual association area would say that's a person. And that's a male person. But uh, perhaps wouldn't go a whole lot further past that. If you knew that I was the instructor for the course, you would also then associate that particular piece of information in and say, oh, that's a person, that is a specific person, and that specific person means this thing, whatever that would happen to mean for you. So all these things, again, have a primary area and association area, and those two work together to make sense of all the senses that come in. If we look at this from the inside, the nice color coding there helps us keep track of what's going on and where it's happening. If we look at the primary motor cortex, so the, I guess, really dark pink slice there, and then the primary somatosensory cortex, the dark blue stripe right behind it, we'll see that there's a deep groove in between them called the central sulcus. And that's sort of a dividing point be between the mo movement part of motor function in the pink and the sensory component of motor function in the dark blue. If we look at that from this perspective, it sort of helps us figure out what's going on. So if we look at the pink side, it would give us an idea of how much of that section is involved in the moving or motor function aspect of that part of the body. And the same spot in the blue would give us an idea for how much of the sensory component is involved for that part of the body as well. So let's look at it from the motor perspective. If we have tongue and swallowing, motor function, it takes up that amount of space. If we look at that amount of space over on the sensory side, it looks like running the mouth from a swallowing tongue movement perspective is about the same amount of sensory component as there is motor component. And that sort of makes sense. To be able to swallow and run the tongue, you need to be able to feel what's going on in there. And so you know what you're doing and whether or not it's the right direction. If we look at the face from a motor perspective, from jaw, lips, eye, brow, that sort of thing, and then look at the sensory component, there's a little bit less sensory component than there is motor component, but it's relatively balanced there. If we look at the hands, the hands are almost exactly equal in sensory and motor function, and that makes sense because as a very complicated motor machine, the hands need a lot of sensory component to tell them where are you, what are you doing, what have you achieved, and how do you get to the next thing you want to achieve. So for your hands to work, you do need to feel what part of them is actually moving and actually doing something. If we look at the arm running from the wrist up to the shoulder, from a sensory component and a motor component, it looks like it's about the same. When we look at the head, the head has some sensory component to it, but there is no associated motor component to it in that place. And that's because the head is actually moved by the neck. And so when we go back over to motor function, we do see the neck there, right between the head and the arm. So that's going to move the head. So that was in its own place, but there is no direct uh, within the head moving of the head. If we look at the trunk of the body, it's uh, roughly the same in sensory and motor, maybe a little bit more motor than there is sensory. If we look at the knee, there's a lot of motor movement for the knee, and that makes sense because it's a very bendable part of the body, but not very much in the way of sensory. So we don't necessarily need to feel the knee moving to know where it's going and keep track of it that way. The foot has a lot of sensory function, but not nearly as much motor function.
because as the part of the body we're standing on, it is necessary to know when the feet are touching the ground and how they're touching the ground to coordinate things, but there's not nearly as much movement that goes on in the foot relative to the amount of sensory that goes on there. Toes would then have some motor function, but not necessarily be so overly involved in sensory. An interesting little piece pops up here as well when we get to the genitals. The genitals have a reasonable amount of sensory function, but there is no motor function to the genitals. And so this might raise a little question for some of you. What we're really saying here is that the, let's just take them from the male perspective, this is probably where you're going to argue this the most, the penis clearly would be capable of sensory function, of feeling things, but the penis within itself cannot move. And again, some of you are starting to think, um, wait a minute, I don't believe that because I think I've perhaps experienced a penis moving before. And the real solution there is that the penis within itself did not move because there are no muscles within the penis. Uh, so therefore, it's incapable of movement. Now, there are muscles that attach to the base of the penis and run up into the core of the body, and those can move, which would then result in eventual movement of the penis. But again, within the penis itself, there is no muscle contraction, no movement. Clearly, though, sensation would be relevant to the function of the penis, but again, movement of the penis itself has nothing to do with it. I promised you a look at the wiring of the brain. So here we start getting an idea of what parts of the brain are connected to what parts of the brain. And so if we look at the top image here, we have three different kinds of fibers or three different sets of wires. And the first one, the pink fibers, are the association fibers. And these are going to be connections between nerves, or nerve cells rather, within the same part of the brain. So just wiring a particular region to itself. The commissural fibers are going to connect the same region to the opposite same region in the other side of the brain. So if we were in the temporal region in the left hemisphere, the commissural fibers would connect that region to the temporal lobe on the other side. So that is left to right side of the brain communication. The third type of fiber here are projection fibers, and that's going to lead from the brain to the spinal cord. So this is the connection between the brain and the spinal cord. So again, association fibers within a particular part of the brain wiring it to itself. Commissural fibers wiring the same type of brain tissue to left and right sides and then projection fibers going from the brain out to the spinal cord. If we look at the brain from the side view instead of from the bottom, we see the same sorts of things happening here. We can just get a little bit better appreciation for the direction that that wiring is running. Before we go any farther, let's talk about cerebral dominance. Cerebral dominance refers to which hemisphere of the brain is most in charge. So we've already said that both sides of the brain are involved in the same things, but one side of the brain will be more significantly in charge of overall function than the other. Perhaps you've heard of people being left-brained or right-brained. And this is what we're talking about is cerebral dominance. So in most people, the left hemisphere is more involved in language, math, logic, analytical abilities. And again, in most people, the right side is more artistic, emotional, creative, intuitive. Uh, imaginative. So what we would discover then is most people who are more mathematically inclined are probably going to be left-brained. 
And most people who are musically or artistically and creatively inclined are more likely to be right-brained. Now what's interesting here is to remember that right brain controls left body and left brain controls right body. So if you're mathematically and analytically inclined, we said that was probably left brained, that means you're probably right handed. If you're creative, artistic, emotional, and we don't mean emotional as in crying because the puppy in the window is so cute, but emotional as being emotionally engaged, we would say, as part of that creative and artistic expression, you are more likely to be, because you're right-brained, left-handed. So ask yourself, which are you? And then look at which handed are you? And uh, you might be surprised at how closely you line up to this. Now we said about 90% of people will fall cleanly into that category. There's no particular law that says that it's impossible for the right brain to be mathematical and analytical and the left brain to be artistic and creative. But again, most people line up to be uh, have those functions more clearly coming from that particular side of the body. Here we have a little bit of a discussion of basal nuclei. Basal nuclei have some engagement in motor function, but I really want to focus more here on their function in cognition and emotion. And it seems that the basal nuclei have a significant role in taking all of the input and all of the response options and filtering them and saying well this response uh, maybe not such a good idea that response maybe not so appropriate this response probably the best response and pass that on then to the cortex and then probably that's what's actually going to happen um, so some people seem to have no filter and any thought that comes into their mind comes right out of their mouth and any action that comes to mind, they seem to do it, and they don't seem to have any filter or any control. And partially, perhaps, it's the basal nuclei not doing such a good job at filtering options and analyzing options and determining which options are really good ones and which ones probably wouldn't give you the best outcomes. Motor functionality, obviously, is important as well. So it seems the basal nuclei function in motor activity in terms of determining when to start, when to stop, and how significant that particular movement should be. They would also help to determine, is this an appropriate movement, or does this particular movement have nothing to do with this particular issue at all? then it should be no surprise that if there's something wrong with the basal nuclei, it might then express as some sort of physical movement disorder. And I'm thinking Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. And in both of those cases, there is uncontrolled movement of the body. So that suggests that the basal nuclei are failing to appropriately start, appropriately stop, and uh, to appropriately control the intensity of those movements. So with Huntington's, it can be very dramatic and uncontrolled flailing of the arms and really just uh, flailing of the entire body for that matter. And those movements are often quite dramatic and exaggerated. So in that case, the basal nuclei not keeping the appropriate intensity and not turning it off when it doesn't really need to be there. Parkinson's would involve not usually so much dramatic physical movement, but in this case, constant movement. So the inability to stop moving. And usually that expresses as muscle tremors. So a particular muscle, and it seems to often occur in the arms, is one of the first places it shows up. The muscle just sits there and twitches. And it might cause the entire arm to sit there and somewhat shake uh, uncontrollably. And that's, in that case, the basal nuclei failing to stop that particular movement when, again, there's no need for it. So a relatively small section of the brain here having a really big outcome in terms of movement and with some serious problems that you have at least heard of before, if not personally known someone who had it.
And Huntington's, fortunately, isn't as common as Parkinson's, so you probably have known multiple people with Parkinson's. If you've ever worked in a nursing home before, you'd probably discover somewhere around 20% or more of that population would be suffering from that particular problem. Next on our list here is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is responsible for coordinating muscle contractions to make sure that the desired outcome is actually achieved. So if you need to walk, the brain will then say, we want to walk. The cerebellum is tasked with actually making you walk, with actually coordinating what muscles need to contract, what muscles need to relax, to move you, to keep you balanced, to keep you upright, and keep everything coordinated. Some people are naturally very coordinated. And it seems like they never make an ungraceful move. They never seem to trip and fall. They never seem to appear clumsy. And that probably just means their cerebellum is working really well. Some people are clumsy. They're uncoordinated. They don't seem to have any natural grace and smoothness. And everything about their movement and their functionality seems to be a little bit klutzy. And that probably means that the cerebellum isn't really working that well. That can be the result of an injury, or it can perhaps just mean that their cerebellum was never that great. And what you notice this most especially with is children when they're learning to walk. When they first learn to walk, the brain says, here's what I want. But the cerebellum has no practice yet. And again, practice makes the brain's function better. So when children first start trying to walk, they try to mimic what they see other people do, but they're very clumsy. They fall all the time. They can't seem to be any kind of coordinated or any kind of together with it. But the more they do it, the better and smoother they get. And by the time you reach adulthood, typically you're moving, hopefully, very well in a coordinated fashion. And so that's just an example of the cerebellum practicing, learning, and getting better. When we talk about memory, memory is a complicated process, and some of you probably feel like your memory isn't what it ought to be, especially when it's time for a test. So let's talk a little bit about memory, and now that this semester is almost over, I'm going to teach you how to learn and remember things better. You're welcome. So memory comes in a couple of different uh, forms, if you will. We can have declarative memory or fact memory. That's names, dates, words, facts and figures. So learning a particular bone name or muscle name would be declarative memory. Procedural memory would be things like playing a piano or a guitar or doing something like that that required training. Motor memory involves muscle movement and coordination in a memorized fashion. So riding a bicycle, for example. And then emotional memory is an emotional response associated with a particular stimulus. So we might say that procedural memory, learning how to play a piano, is also very closely tied with motor memory. How can you remember where to put your hands to actually execute that skills memory or that procedural memory if you have no motor memory of how to move your arm and put the hand in the right place? So I would propose that many procedural memories actually need motor memories along with them so that it will actually work. So let's think about musical instruments. Some of you perhaps have learned at some point in your life how to play a particular instrument, but let's say it's been a long time since you actually did it. So the procedural memory is there, 
the motor memory was there, but you pick it up and you go to do it again after a long time of not doing it, and what you might then find is that you're not quite as good as you used to be. Because the memories, just like everything else, the more they're used, the more clear they remain. So those memories of how to do it and where to put the hands and where to move the fingers have started to fade. But what you do find is when you sit down, it starts to come back relatively quickly. And it probably comes back to you much more quickly than it did when you learned it the first time through. Because it was there, you just weren't as good at using it because it had gotten a little bit rusty. The idea of riding a bicycle. And there's been this question throughout all of time since bicycles were invented. And that is, if you were once able to ride a bicycle, are you always able to ride a bicycle? In other words, does that motor memory and that skills memory stay with you, or is it something that can be lost? So what would happen if it had been 20 years since you'd ridden a bicycle? Would you be able to do it? A couple summers ago, I had the opportunity to test that very question. I used to, when I was growing up, ride a bicycle a lot, and it was not uncommon to ride five miles or more in a day. And so, obviously, I was quite comfortable with riding a bike. My memory in terms of skill and uh, motor memory was very finely tuned, and it worked well. And then about two summers ago, it had the opportunity to ride a bicycle again, and it had probably been close to 20 years since I'd ridden a bicycle. And so I asked myself, am I going to be able to do this or not? And so I decided to go ahead and try it. And what I discovered is, yes, I still knew how to ride a bicycle. Yes, it still worked. But just like picking up a musical instrument after 10 years or so of not playing it, I wasn't overly great at it. And I didn't crash. I didn't fall over. But I felt very unbalanced and very unstable because my motor memory and skills memory to keep everything perfectly balanced and centered on the bicycle were a little bit off. Now after a little while of riding the bicycle I did start feeling more comfortable and like things were moving more smoothly but the entire experience was only about an hour and so even at the end of that hour of learning it again I didn't feel any kind of comfortable on it yet. And quite frankly at this point in my life if I never sat on a bicycle again I'll be okay with that. But uh, it was just an interesting refresher on the idea that these memories do in fact stay there, but they don't necessarily get pulled out perfectly after long periods of, in, of uh, inactivity or unuse. In the idea of short of uh, rather declarative memory or the fact memory, there are two different categories of that. And we can have short-term memory and long-term memory. So this uh, graphic here really is about that process. So let's say there's a stimulus. You see, you feel, you hear, you smell something, some sort of sensory input, and it goes into temporary storage in the cerebral cortex. So in other words, it goes to the brain. Then short-term memory actually registers and is retained for a short period of time. But what happens with that short-term memory is very important. Short-term memory is limited. Its capacity is about eight pieces of information at a time. So I could read a sentence to you, and your short-term memory could grab that and spit it back. I could throw out a telephone number, and your short-term memory could grab that and hold it and throw it back. But as soon as I start giving you the next sentence, or start giving you the next telephone number, pieces of that first number start getting deleted one at a time, making room for the new incoming information. Because again, that memory was limited in capacity. So once something is in short-term memory, it is either forgotten or basically deleted because it didn't go to long-term memory before the next information came in. So that would go to the data permanently lost category because it wasn't truly saved in the memory. Or it could go to long-term memory. Long-term memory has no maximum capacity that we've been able to determine anyway. And once it is there, we believe that it is there forever. The question is just finding it when you want it. And again, the more often you access that particular memory, 
the more clearly that pathway to that particular storage file is kept. But if you don't use that particular information for a really long period of time, the pathway to access it may become somewhat corrupted. What you may find after a while is you say, oh yes, I do finally remember that now. So you finally found the pathway to that file of information. The question is, how do we get something from short-term memory to long-term memory so it's actually usable? So you learn the bone names, and that's great, but if you can't get it into long-term memory and access that file when it's time for the bone quiz, well, that's kind of useless. So here are the ways in which you can assist in converting something from short-term to long-term memory. The first one here is rehearsal or repetition. This is probably the method you most use. When you study, do you use note cards? Do you reread the material? Do you self-quiz yourself? All of those are forms of rehearsal or repetition. The old-fashioned idea of write your spelling words ten times each was all about repetition. And the thought is the more times you put it into short-term memory, the more likely it is that it will eventually end up in long-term memory just by a matter of it's been presented so many times it will eventually take. That works, but that takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, and it's not incredibly efficient. That is, however, the method that most of you probably use for most of your learning and studying experiences. Association is a more powerful and more effective method of converting to long-term memory. And it's just like it sounds. You associate or you connect new material or new information with something that you already knew. And for this particular course, that hopefully is something that's easy to do often. All of you, before you started this course, would have known something about how the body works. Hopefully your understanding is greatly improved at this point, but you already knew something. So when we talk about Parkinson's disease, for example, and what goes on with that, you've already heard of Parkinson's disease before. You've already perhaps seen some people with it, and you've perhaps seen those symptoms. And so you would have already known a few pieces of information. So then I give you new information about it, and you can say, okay, I already knew A, now I see B, and I can see how B connects with A. And because you've been able to understand a connection between previously existing long-term memory and new information trying to go there, it ties it together and more effectively connects it and plugs it in. A third category, though, of conversion is by far superior mm -hmm to repetition or association. And that is what the book is labeled as excitement. I particularly call it emotional impact. So if there's some sort of emotional response to this stuff in short-term memory or to something associated with it, then that very powerfully and very effectively converts it into a long-term memory. Do you perhaps remember uh, something or just do this ask yourself what is my most powerful memory then when you think about what's a big time memory for me what's the first thing that comes to mind odds are that particular memory has a lot of emotion attached to it so if you've ever been in a car wreck before and you were actually conscious for the experience you probably remember every single detail about it not because you wanted to not because you thought this will be really nice to sit and think about when I get old, but because you didn't have a choice in the matter. There was an emotional connection with it, probably a negative one. I hope you didn't get excited because you were in a car wreck today and it just made your day. But to that emotional impact very effectively and without any effort on your part, put that stuff into long-term memory. I remember the first time I was involved in a vehicle accident. And it was very clearly my fault. I know this because I was there. I wasn't paying attention, and I rear-ended someone. Uh, it was clearly my fault. There was no argument about that on my side. Uh, the other person in the experience voluntarily accepted responsibility for the situation. I didn't argue with them. Uh, but there was obviously a negative emotional impact with that 
And so because of that, all of those details that really had no impact on the rest of my life are all very clearly still there. And I can relive that entire experience for that entire day is, is from start to finish how it worked out. And uh, I can remember all of that, even though I never had the thought of, I want to remember this. <clears throat> Another option for conversion to long-term memory is this idea of automatic memory. And automatic memory is sort of a magical thing that we don't have a good explanation for, but it just seems that some things automatically go from um, perception to long-term memory with no processing and short-term memory, no particular technique involved, it just happened. So perhaps you can remember some things that you would ask yourself, why did I remember that? And where was that even from? So sometimes we know things or remember things that we perhaps can't even remember where they came from. And so that's probably an example of this idea of automatic memory. You weren't paying attention. You perhaps weren't even conscious of that particular piece of information, and it went to long-term memory. So some people's brains work better in some areas than others. Some people work well with the repetition. Some people not so much, maybe need the association. I would propose that everyone works better with a little bit of emotional impact. And so for this class, especially if we were in person, I would have deliberately stimulated some conversations, some discussions, perhaps even something bordering on debate for the purpose of adding emotional impact. And I would have always taken the approach of being a little bit aggressive, a little bit pushy, and a little bit seeming to be insensitive because that seems to stimulate emotional engagement in the topic. And then all of a sudden you don't realize it, but you are learning better. That's also fun for me to stir you up just a little bit. In this virtual setting, because you can't see me and my reactions and, and we can't work through things as smoothly, I try to avoid some of those controversial things simply because it's, it's harder for you to actually understand what I really mean rather than what I'm saying just to introduce some emotional impact. Here's an idea of monitoring brain activity. And monitoring brain activity gives us a great deal of insight into what's going on in the brain at that time. So this would be a setup, and, and newer versions of this equipment probably look a lot fancier than this one. But the idea is you're measuring electrical current in the head. And that then gives us an idea of exactly how active the brain is in that process. So this is called an EEG. And brain wave readouts are going to be, again, measurements of electrical current, and they're going to look like one of these four different types of waves. The first example here are alpha waves. And in alpha waves, this is the kind of wave or brain activity you expect to see in someone who's awake but is relaxed. So not necessarily very much focused on any one thing, but uh, you're conscious, but you're not necessarily engaging in high-level brain function to speak of. So what we see there is that the brain wave activity is relatively stable or relatively uniform in both amplitude and in frequency. So the waves go up and down about the same amount on average. There aren't any great deviations there. And the frequency of those waves is pretty uniform as well. So this is your brain in neutral. Beta waves we see have more irregularity in frequency and in amplitude, but it's still somewhat stable. And this would be someone who's awake but alert. So let's say you're actually focused on something. Like hopefully your brain would have this sort of waves right now as you're watching and listening to this lecture, meaning you're awake and you're actually focused and paying attention. You're actually thinking about what's going on rather than just riding through on neutral saying I clicked the play button and now I'm good. So this is very common to see in awake but alert people. Theta waves you see become even more irregular in amplitude and in frequency. 
Now, this is a really common brain state for children who have very active, very investigative type minds, just sort of as a default condition for how their brain thinks. As adults, we could occasionally see theta waves in someone who's really focused. So if you are really working hard on something, hopefully during an exam, you would see theta waves going on. When you're really focused, you're really thinking hard, you're really trying to dial in there and get the exact right thing out, this indicates greater intensity of brain function and focus. Delta waves uh, are sort of unlike anything we've seen so far because they don't have really much in the way of sharp points to the bottom or top of each one of those waves. This is what you would see in an adult who is sleeping and not in light sleep. This would be in deep sleep, so probably in a dream cycle. And we'll talk about REM and dream cycles and things like that here in just a moment. But that's normal to see in a sleeping adult. It is not normal to see in an adult that's awake. And if it does occur in an adult that is awake, that suggests some sort of brain damage. So when you're asleep or when the reticular activating system isn't working, it's turned off, if you will, then this kind of wave is present. So again, sleeping is normally the time we'd expect to see that. Electrical current in the brain sometimes goes a little crazy, and this becomes very obvious and evident in the idea of seizures. So basically a seizure occurs when the brain electrical current somewhat spasms or short circuits. It spikes, it misfires, it, it kind of just goes crazy for a little bit of time. And there's a number of different causes that could lead to something like that, but they're going to typically be categorized in one of two different categories. And I really don't like the modern naming of these. The first one is absence seizures. And those used to be referred to as petite mal seizures. Petite meaning small. So a small deformity in brain function, a small seizure. And in that case, uh, it might usually last for a very short period of time. And might express as only sort of a blank expression or seeming like someone just tuned out for a few seconds and then came back. That could be just a brain tuning out or it could be the indication of an absence seizure. And I understand the new naming on that because you seem to be mentally absent from a situation. So that sort of makes sense. But the larger scale is now called a tonic-clonic seizure. It uh, used to be they were called grand mal, so grand meaning big. So a petite mal was a small seizure, a grand mal was a big seizure. And that was somewhat descriptive and useful. Uh, I don't know where the tonic-clonic seizure idea comes from. I don't know if you uh, are supposed to drink a, a tonic and then become catted. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. But I personally would use grand mal and petite mal in my own wordings because that is more widely recognized and understood and is actually descriptive. In that case, the person is going to react by more than just a simple seeming to be mentally checked out for a few seconds. They would actually lose, very obviously lose consciousness. Often there would be a great deal of seizure activity in the body, meaning convulsions, meaning uncontrolled body flailing and movements. Uh, and sometimes very violently. So if you're addressing someone who's experiencing one of those, you do not want to try to control them. You don't want to hold them down because they very well could hurt you and you might actually hurt them more in the process as well. So my recommendation for handling those folks is to keeping in mind first of all your safety and well-being is to try to cushion, try to support, try to make sure that they don't bounce their head off of a concrete floor or hurt themselves. So gentle supportive cushioning and typically within a couple of minutes that will stop. Now, certainly you would want to seek additional medical attention for them because you want to figure out what went wrong. Now, sometimes diabetics, if their sugar gets off one way or the other too much, especially too rapidly, they can experience this sort of thing. Uh, so it might be just a temporary metabolic condition or it might be something indicating, let's say, a brain tumor or some major brain confusion and disruption of function. Uh, 
There might be loss of bladder control and bowel control, so you might have uncontrolled bowel movements and emptying of bladders. And the tongue can get in the way, and they can clamp their jaw and bite their tongue. And in the olden days, there was an idea of you want to put something in their mouth so that they don't bite their tongue off. But the problem with that becomes they're flopping all over the place. And how can you safely, for you or for them, do this without having your fingers bitten off or it slipping into their mouth and causing them to choke or some other issues? So again, gentle support. If it's safe for you to help them not hurt themselves more. If they're on the ground, perhaps you might roll them on their side, and that will help to make sure the tongue doesn't flop into the back of the throat and cause them to choke. But I certainly wouldn't recommend putting your hands anywhere near their mouth because unintentionally on their part, they might well bite off your finger. When we talk about brain functionality here, we want to talk about consciousness. So what is consciousness? And we talk about people losing consciousness, but what does that really mean? And uh, there's a series of categories of consciousness that go from alert, meaning you're aware of your environment, you're appropriately responsive to your environment, and when something changes, you know it. Uh, drowsiness or lethargy would be the next step in the process. So you're still aware of what's going on, but you're not keeping up with changes in the environment nearly as well and uh, your responses are going to be more delayed and perhaps less appropriate. Now this is normal as you would go into a normal sleep cycle, but it can also be a stage of consciousness as, as it is with sleeping obviously, but it can be assessed in a not just getting ready to go to sleep process as well. The third progression would be stupor. And in stupor, the person is uh, very minimally responsive to changes in the environment. Their reactions are certainly not going to be appropriate. They might appear to be somewhat asleep, uh, but they're not technically in a sleep stage. Um, so this is probably where you would most become aware of someone's loss of consciousness in this stage. And then the last step in the progression is coma, in which point they are completely unresponsive to the environment as best as we can tell, are usually completely unaware of the environment. And uh, at that point, certainly needs to have some medical attention. If you think about fainting, that would be a brief loss of consciousness. Most often, that's a temporary change in blood flow to the brain. So if the brain becomes temporarily deprived of oxygen, it will shut off. And not completely, but it will shut off enough that it sort of puts the body into a neutral for a period of time until blood flow returns appropriately. Uh, the idea of coma, again, would be an extended process. This is not a couple of minutes kind of thing. This usually would be hours to days in that case. It's far beyond a deep sleep because, again, there's uh, the brain waves are not nearly as pronounced as we would normally see in sleep. And uh, at that point, uh, brain consumption of oxygen is going to go down. So when you're asleep in a normal sleeping process, your brain's consumption of oxygen is roughly the same as it is when you're awake because it's just as active while you're asleep. And sometimes it might be a little bit more active while you're asleep than when you're awake. But in coma, there isn't an increase or maintenance of brain activity. It's actually shutting down. So you would see a oxygen consumption rate below a normal resting kind of consumption rate. So that's another indicator of it's not just deep sleep, it's a coma. All kinds of things can cause that. Blunt force trauma, tumors, infections, significant metabolic problems, drug overdose, the list really goes on and on. But the possible ending here is a condition called brain dead. And in a brain-dead individual, it is determined that they are experiencing an irreversible coma. And the way this is really determined is that the readout, or so we're seeing the EEG readouts here, wouldn't have any of these activity lines, but it would just be sort of a flat line, like you would see with someone whose EKG for heart function is flatlined. The EEG readout for the brain would be similar to that. 
And at that point, a physician is going to say, we believe that this person will never recover consciousness again. And at that point, the physician can declare a person legally dead. Um, they might still be breathing, they might still have a heartbeat and things like that, but if there's no higher level brain function, they're determined to be brain dead. And the doctor's recommendation at that point is if there is some sort of life support going on, that uh, they be declared dead and then that support disconnected. Obviously this would be a difficult call for a doctor to make because there are people who experience comas for long periods of time and then wake up from them, perhaps 20 years or so in a coma and then just one day wake up as if nothing ever happened. A number of problems go along with that, one of which is they've missed 20 years of life, so have no idea what's going on, and they might think that uh, Ronald Reagan was still president, but uh, other things in terms of bodily function are certainly going to decline. Uh, your muscle tone would be quite weak, bones would be weaker, the heart would be weaker, everything would have been in this vegetative state, so your overall health isn't going to be that great after a long period of unconsciousness and regaining it. But the doctor will have to calculate what they feel are the odds of a person waking up in any sort of functional status and then make their uh, recommendation and then the family would have to decide whether they wanted to do that or not. Complicated topic, we could spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, it often, or maybe I should say at least occasionally, ends in legal action involving a judge in a courtroom. Some of you perhaps were are old enough to recall the uh, Terry Schiavo case in Florida a number of years back now. I'm showing my age a little bit when I clearly remember this experience. And the fight was over who had the authority to decide to unplug the person from life support. And I believe that they had been, uh, this was the wife that was in a coma, and the doctors had checked off saying that they felt it was appropriate to disconnect. The husband decided to unplug, then the uh, wife's parents sued for rights and tried to uh, prevent him from unplugging her. And there was a number of uh, complications in that scenario. Biologically, I think she was really just brain dead and no coming back from that, but it got into all kinds of different arguments and that and ended up in court. Several years of fighting back and forth before ultimately, uh, I believe the husband prevailed and uh, unplugged her and she became not only brain dead, but uh, dead by every sense of the definition. Let's talk about sleep. What we see with brain activity, as we've mentioned, the alpha, the delta, the beta waves, all that good stuff, is going to change as you progress through different levels of sleep. So at the top in the red here we have the awake. So that's going to be our alpha waves there for the most part. And sleep is going to go through a progression. And it go, you go from awake to in REM 1, and then 2, 3, 4, and back again. In REM stands for non-rapid eye movement. REM stands for rapid eye movement. So someone who is in REM sleep, you can actually observe them and see their eyes very rapidly moving back and forth under the eyelids. So that's why it's called rapid eye movement sleep. So the progression is going to go through these. And what we see is that as you become relaxed, the alpha waves were there, and they are going to trend towards the theta waves, becoming more irregular as you progress deeper into sleep. So in stage one, a person is easily aroused. That means they're easily awoken, and they relatively quickly respond to changes in the environment. So they're getting in that drowsy, in that lethargic stage. And you can say, hey, wake up, and they'll pop out of it. After they progress to stage two, the EEG readout gets a little bit more erratic, but it's also more difficult to wake someone up. So you might have to say, hey, wake up, a little bit louder, so more difficult to wake them. In stage three, we start seeing theta waves and occasionally some delta waves show up here. And obviously the person is more difficult to wake up. You might have to give them a shaking. But an important thing that happens here that hadn't happened yet in this process is the decline of vital signs. This means that breathing rate's going to slow down. 
heart rate's going to slow down, and you wouldn't have seen those sorts of things yet until you get to stage three of sleep. I learned all about this when my oldest daughter was going through a phase earlier in her life, and she would not go to sleep unless I was in the room with her. And I quickly discovered that she had to be really asleep before I could even think the thought of trying to sneak out of the room. And so she would be what I was convinced was very asleep, even to the point of almost seeming to snore a little bit, I thought. Perhaps it was just wishful thinking. But I would be convinced she was asleep, so it was safe for me to leave the room. And as soon as I twitched to get up and leave, that daddy radar would go off, and she'd say, Daddy, where are you going? And, well, I would take a deep breath and sigh and start the process all over again. So what I learned was that until she hits stage three, don't even bother thinking about leaving. So when she would all of a sudden take a big deep breath and then her breathing rate would really slow down noticeably. That's when I knew she was in stage three and she was deep enough in the process that she wouldn't be woken up by the slightest, tiniest movement or sound. And at that point it was safe for me to at least attempt to try to leave the room and most likely be able to get away with it. So that's something that if you're watching someone as they fall asleep, you can definitely tell when they go from two to three, when their breathing rate slows down. And it will do so almost like you flip a switch for a light bulb that quickly. After three, you would go to four, and there you're going to see mostly the delta waves. Difficult to wake somebody up, so they would definitely would need a little shaking there. If they're going to wet the bed, if they're going to have night terrors, or if they're going to sleepwalk, this is when that will happen. So in this stage, they are deep enough in sleep that they don't necessarily always keep track of what's going on in their environment. So wetting the bed is something that is basically you're deep enough in sleep you don't realize the need to get up and go to the bathroom. And when we talk about night terrors, we're not talking about probably a bad dream that you remember because that's probably going to be more like what we'll experience in REM sleep here in a little bit. But this is the sort of thing that's going to be very, very dramatic, very intense, perhaps very violent kind of dreaming. And this is somewhere that I want to caution you. If someone is experiencing night terrors, be very careful how you approach them. Because in that state of lack of consciousness of their real environment, whatever that night terror is, they're acting out. And if you go up to them and try to shake them or comfort them, they might perceive you as that horribly scary thing they're fighting against in that night terror or whatever it happens to be and act it out on you, actually attack you, actually hurt you. So just do be careful dealing with folks in that condition because they can be unconsciously very violent. Again, sleepwalking would occur here as well. And what happens in stage four is something that the person who experienced it does not remember. So you're not necessarily going to remember that you sleepwalked or that you had this particular behavior that occurred. And my oldest went through a, a long period of time where she had a lot of night terrors and a lot of sleepwalking. And uh, I learned very quickly that a couple of times I got too close at the wrong point in that experience and I got clocked for it. Uh, she would what she thought was defending herself and she would actually just whack me in the face and I quickly learned that if I approach, I approach from the side, not nose first, and uh, ease into this carefully to see what's really going to happen here. But the next day, she, I would ask her about it and she would not recall a single thing about what she did, what she said, how the experience went or anything like that. Kind of interesting that you would do so much physically and not remember a thing. This would also be if people are going to talk in their sleep, probably when that's going to occur as well. After you're in stage four, then you'll go back to three, then to two, then to one, and then you'll reach REM. Now REM is different from non-REM in that besides the speed of eye movement, this is where real dreaming or full dreaming occurs and a key difference here between REM and stage four is that in REM, your body is paralyzed. It's locked in position so that you can't act out 
whatever happens in those dreams because that could be truly horrendous outcomes. So someone dreaming in REM sleep is not going to be able to whack you or attack you or anything like that. But in stage four, they could respond that way. If you honestly assess your dreams, I'm hoping that you are not much different from me. But what happens in your dreams, at least the ones you remember, is some really, really disturbing stuff. You do things in dreams you would never imagine or even contemplate doing in real life. And so the idea of being paralyzed while imagining in your brain this kind of behavior is probably a good thing so that you don't actually do it because that would lead to no doubt all kinds of legal problems and, and lots of other issues too. So I've, I've done truly horrible things in my REM cycle dreams uh, to the point of killing people that I loved in my dream and, and then afterwards being very uh, upset about that in the dream. And if I remembered any of it when I woke up, it caused additional discomfort throughout the day just thinking about, and it doesn't make you a horrible person because you have these thoughts in your brain. It turns out your brain is very creative, probably to a fault, in how it makes up dreams. So before we move on to the night's progression of sleep cycles back and forth, let's briefly talk about why do you sleep? And the answer is not so you can get energy rebuilt in your body. The answer is not so your body can repair itself, although those things do happen, but those could also happen by just you know, laying in the lazy chair for a couple of hours too. So the reason we sleep is so that we can dream during the REM cycle. The reason we dream during the REM cycle is to process all the information that came into the brain during the day, decide what's important and keep it, and decide what's not important and delete it. So as you're driving along on a normal non-coronavirus day, you might see hundreds to thousands of cars in a day, and your brain actually takes note of those. You probably don't consciously notice every single vehicle. Probably the vehicles you do notice might be a little bit more exotic or unusual because your reticular activating system says that's nothing exciting, ignore it. A Honda Civic is a Honda Civic and there's only 20 million of those on the road so no sense in paying attention to that. But if you see a Porsche or a uh, other high-end car your reticular activating system says that is out of the ordinary. Feel free to take a look at that. Several years ago, I was driving through Hopkinsville and came to a stoplight, and on the other side of a stoplight was an iridescent Corvette. Corvettes are not super uncommon, but they are very expensive, and I'm guessing you don't see very many iridescent Corvettes. So that caught my attention. So it was something out of the ordinary enough. But all the other cars, my brain did in fact notice as well. So during the dreaming process, your body's just, your brain is assessing that stuff and saying it's here. Does it need to be here? If the answer is no, it deletes it. Which explains why often your dreams include some piece of something that's real. A person that's real, a place that's real, some kind of experience or idea that was real, and that was your brain processing that piece of information and making up a whole bunch of stuff that hopefully wasn't real as part of the story. So in a way, your brain processes by building a very elaborate story, assessing the story, and then keeping or deleting the real stuff as necessary. If you don't sleep well one particular night, you feel kind of grouchy and irritable the next day. And that's because your brain didn't get a chance to delete all the useless stuff. And so your brain's somewhat working on information overload. It's overwhelmed. And when it's overwhelmed, it makes you cranky. If you get poor sleep for multiple nights in a row, it gets worse. So it's amazing that uh, people with young children are ever civil uh, to anyone else in life because they don't get much sleep. But again, the point of sleeping is to dream. Dreaming is deleting unnecessary information so that we don't have to keep it around in the system. There's an interesting idea that goes along with sleep as well. As I've told you that, and let's just look at the cycle here, you start in being awake, then you go to stage one, then two, then three, and then four. You stay there for a little while and then you work your way back up out of that sequence 
back to the REM cycle. And you're going to go through that cycle all night long, in and out of the different stages. But as you go, you go less deeply into the non-REM stages, and you spend less time in any of those particular stages and more of that time in REM. That's because you have to work through the process a couple times until you can spend a significant amount of time in REM. So really we need to look like here, uh, it would be nice to have a couple of hours of REM cycle. So if you don't get enough sleep on a regular basis, you don't have a chance to work your way into those. This first couple of little dream cycles here probably aren't going to process much information. But we get out here to the last couple dream cycles and that's where you can get a lot of processing dealt with. And if you don't sleep well enough to get to those, that's when you run into the problems. But again, to get to REM, you have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1, REM. And that's the normal progression. There is a sleep disorder called narcolepsy. And what happens in narcolepsy is you go straight from awake to REM without going through the 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1 cycle. That is a problem because normally in stage one you feel drowsy and you start to realize that I should not be driving a car or I should not be crossing a street or something like that. But someone with narcolepsy goes from fully awake to fully paralyzed in an unmoving condition. Can you imagine what would happen if someone was driving a car when that happened? That would be a serious problem. Of additional concern, is, and it can last 15 minutes or maybe a little bit more, it comes on without a whole lot of warning. So sometimes if someone's about to pass out, uh, perhaps they feel a little funny and, and after a few times of that, they know if I feel this way, I'm about to pass out. So pull over and stop or sit down or something like that. But narcolepsy would happen without warning. And it seems to often be associated with a pleasurable feeling. So you hear a good joke or you're playing poker and you get a good hand and you look down and realize I'm going to win this hand and there's a couple hundred dollars on the table and then you go straight into REM sleep for 15 minutes and I'm pretty sure you don't win that hand. So it could be sort of a problem and, and really happy people with lots of uh, pleasurable thoughts and experiences in their lives uh, probably it wouldn't be especially problematic if they had this. One particular example of this would have occurred in a movie that perhaps some of you have never seen because it was released before you were born. But I'm old enough that I saw it as, I believe, a new release. And it was called Rat Race. And the objective was basically a scavenger hunt for clues. And if you happen to find the clues and be the first person to find the last clue, then the prize, it was a large prize. So these people, as people do, became very competitive to the point where they were being absolutely not polite to each other at all. And one of the characters in that was played uh, by Rowan Atkinson, who was also the star of Mr. Bean and uh, I believe Black Adder and a number of others that uh, probably, again, for most of you are old school before your time. But if you're into what you consider to be historical movies, <laughs> this was certainly qualified. And his character was narcoleptic. And multiple times throughout the movie, some sort of happy thought of I found another clue or something like that would come along and he would flat out become paralyzed and asleep. He was actually the first person to find the final clue. And as he realized he'd found the final clue, his hand reached out to pull it out of, I believe, like a locker or post office box or something like that and then he went into REM sleep with his hand extended reaching for the clue. The next person comes along finds it and leaves him standing there unconscious. Um, I think in the end it worked out to where the unscrupulous people got what they deserved but definitely an, an application of where in real life this would be inconvenient at best. We could go on for weeks, really, about brain function and how things work, but we don't have that sort of time. So let's move on to the spinal cord. The spinal cord's job is to take information from the brain 
and distribute it out to the rest of the body. And then to also take information from the body and send it back to the brain. So if we look at a spinal cord from top to bottom here, we see the presence of a cervical enlargement and a lumbar enlargement, where the spinal cord actually gets larger in diameter. And if we look at picture B, that's what the cervical enlargement would look like. So up here at the top, we've got normal um, size vertebrae or spinal cord. Then it gets a little thicker. Then it goes back down to the regular size again. And in the uh, lumbar region, it enlarges as well. So my question for you is why would the spinal cord get thicker right there at the shoulders and thicker there about halfway down the abdominal cavity? The simplest answer for this is that's where in the cervical enlargement that the arms plug in. So all the nerves coming from the arms will plug in there. The more plug-ins, uh, the more wires you need to plug in, the bigger the set of plug-ins you need. So think of uh, spinal enlargements as really power strips so that you can plug in more nerves to that particular spot. It just needs to be bigger to fit more connections. In the lumbar enlargement region, you have uh, things coming in from the uh, abdominal cavity, lots of info coming in there. Plus, you have everything plugging in from the legs and lower abdominal cavity. So, again, lots and lots of things plugging in there. You just need a wider strip to plug into. Down there at the end of the spinal cord, which is actually occurring right there about your umbilical uh, location, you have the cauda equina. That's literally interpreted means horse's tail. And what's happening there is it does sort of look like a horse's tail, but the spinal cord is going from a large bundle of nerves branching out into individual nerves, which are then going to mostly go to the hips and the legs. So that's just where the spinal cord is ending, really, and branching out into separate nerves at that point. That's also going to be where lumbar punctures occur, whether it's collecting cerebrospinal fluid for analysis or administering an epidural. And the reason why it's done there low in the lumbar region is that there's more space. Because the nerves are branching out, there's some empty space at the back of the cavity there, and they can then stick a needle in there and not have as much risk of hitting and damaging nerves. That's also in the location where you most likely need that epidural to deal with the, the challenges of childbirth, for example, uh, or for lower back pain is the, really the two things that that's used for the most. And so that's going to be an appropriate location for that, plus the fact, again, that less risk of damaging things there. If we look at how the spinal cord interfaces with the peripheral nervous system, so with the nerves outside of the brain and spinal cord, it's kind of interesting. And here's a view looking straight down the spinal cord. And we can see the dorsal root ganglion coming in there, basically the nerves from the rest of the body plugging into the spinal cord. If we look at those a little closer, it would look like this. And what we find is a dorsal root ganglion, and we also have a, a ventral root uh, coming in there as well. So we have input and outgoing signals going on there. So let's look at that specifically in this image. What we can see here is that the dorsal root is the sensory input coming from the body and plugging into the spinal cord. The ventral root is where the motor nerves come out. So the response to the sense. Remember the nervous system's job is to monitor sensory input integrate it or process it and then have a motor response. So this is that interface or that connection where the sensory information comes in, integration at least starts to occur, and then motor output results from that. So dorsal root incoming senses, ventral root motor output. Sometimes the integration happens all the way back up to the brain, then back out, and sometimes the spinal cord does all of the integration itself. There are quite a few pages in the text taken up with this idea of ascending and descending tracts of the spinal cord. I'm not going to beat this topic too aggressively, uh, 
I do want to, though, point out that the spinal cord is not just a single bundle of stuff that all the information runs through the same wire. It's rather a collection of wires. So really these tracts are really just describing the different wires. And each bundle of wires goes to a specific place and does a specific thing. So again, it's, it's a matter of keeping things as separate as we can so that signals don't get mixed. We wouldn't want a signal going out to the foot to tell the foot to do something to accidentally go out on the arm. That would be obviously counterproductive. So if there are different tracks for those different parts of the body, so in other words, a totally different set of wires for it, the odds of the signal going the wrong place and doing the wrong thing are greatly reduced. So this is just a very complicated organization system to keep the signaling processes as separate as is possible. So again, I'm not going to beat this too much, but just appreciate all these different wiring systems going on here. And you'll notice each of them going through a different section of the lower brain and a different little area of the spinal cord. So again, all those just representing the different sets of wiring going on there. How did the central nervous system get built and made in the first place? And this is a really good question, especially for those of you who haven't yet had all the children that you're going to have. Because it's very important to understand the central nervous system is the first system of the body that starts to form. And because it's happening so early in the process, in a matter of, let's say, two weeks, after fertilization of that egg, the nervous system is defining itself. And in that time frame, you don't know you're pregnant yet. And I'll harp on this a little bit more in Anatomy 2 when we talk about reproduction. And I'll get into fetal alcohol syndrome. But because you don't know you're pregnant yet at that point, you don't know that you definitely need to avoid alcohol and things like that. Now, it's always a good idea to avoid chemicals like that that could cause problems. But if you didn't know you were pregnant, you're level of feeling of need to avoid them certainly would be less. So in the first couple of weeks after fertilization, everything we see here happens. So what happens is, remember we said the brain the spinal cord was all one tube? Then the brain in started folding up and becoming more complex. What you see here is the formation of that tube to start with. And again, that happens in the first couple of weeks. So if that exposure to the alcohol or to other mutating substances occurs at the wrong time, it can cause mutations in the development of this neural tube to start with, which then becomes permanent malformations of the eventual central nervous system. So it starts out as a flat layer of tissue and then rolls up into a tube. That tube then forms later the spinal cord and then at the end of it folds up into the brain. This is part of your reading assignment, but I did want to mention it just for a moment because it is such a horrendous thing and because it is mostly preventable. This is spina bifida. And what happens in spina bifida is a portion of the vertebrae fail to form around the spinal cord completely. So the spinal cord forms, then the vertebrae are supposed to form around that. And that would help to enclose it, protect it, keep it in place. But in this case, the vertebrae didn't enclose that particular area like it was supposed to. And it turns out that the uh, spinal cord is sort of a high pressure tube. And with no bones to hold it in place, it starts popping out. So what you're seeing here is the spinal cord popping out of the baby's back like a balloon. And again, that was a failure of vertebrae to properly form. This particular picture, I am going to guess that baby did not live much longer than probably max a month after that picture was taken. Because if that, think of it as a big blister. And if that blister pops, like a blister on your hand might pop, fluid comes out. In this case, it's not a small contained little blister. It's all of the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain and spinal cord could leak out here. Basically, uh, the brain would um, lose its fluid. It would somewhat start mashing itself. And then you have wide open opportunity for infection. So if this were to rupture, that would be almost certainly fatal for the child. <laughs> 
Nowadays, we can do testing before the baby's born to know this is going to be the case. And if it's a mild to moderate case, it could be surgically repaired, sometimes even before the baby's born. Now, definitely, if this is in place during the birth process, the birth process must be a C-section. Because if the baby slid through the vaginal canal like this, that would rupture during childbirth and the baby would most likely die very shortly afterwards. So this is what we would consider a severe case, probably. Again, a very, very mild case might be a little bit difficult for the baby to learn to walk and perhaps a little bit of an uneven gait as an adult. Moderate case might mean uh, abnormal uh, curvature of the spine, uh, greater difficulty in walking, perhaps pain. A severe case like this, this is not really survivable. But again, a lot of those are detectable earlier in the process and sometimes fixable. Especially these days with 4D ultrasounds, they can go in there and count hairs on the head with those things. So they would certainly be able to see this sort of thing very clearly. Now the good news about this is that it used to be a common problem. It is no longer a common problem. I fear it will become again someday because people are becoming increasingly unintelligent with their health choices. We have discovered that most cases of spina bifida are due to a nutritional deficiency of the mother during pregnancy. Specifically, a deficiency in folic acid, which for the mother causes folic acid anemia or folic acid deficiency anemia. And for the mother, that just causes anemia, meaning lack of oxygen carrying capacity. But for the baby, it causes this major malformation of the spinal cord. So the solution is, if you look at prenatal vitamins, they are loaded with folic acid. The thought is to prevent this particular nutritional deficiency, which then prevents a vast majority of these spinal malformation cases. So in other words, if you take your prenatals, most concerns about spina bifida go right out the window. So take them. There are an increasing number of people who say, I don't need to take anything artificial or anything the pharmaceutical industry touched or all that stuff. The all-natural route is great. But folks, the all-natural route kills people. Uh, babies die because of these problems. They have these complications because of these problems. We've discovered ways to prevent it. So why not prevent it? So I'm proposing the spina bifida is almost exclusively preventable if mama takes the prenatals. So just do that. And they're not expensive. One little multivitamin a day and it takes care of this problem. To me, that seems like a very reasonable solution. Again, we could go on and on about the central nervous system for a month or more and have barely scratched the surface. The brain is probably what we would consider the final frontier of understanding bodily function. And we'll probably never understand all of it, but hopefully you understand it better than you did before and uh, learn a little bit along the way. Have a good day. I'll see you next time.